On the 6th of November, 1217, the Charter of the Forest was issued, sealed by the boy king, Henry III, acting under the regency of William Marshall. The Charter was issued alongside a new version of Magna Carta, from which it had originally evolved. Compared to the attention showered on Magna Carta, the Charter of the Forest has often been overlooked. However, the Charter of the Forest is an important milestone in the development of the rights of ordinary people. In the Middle Ages, royal forest did not just mean areas of woodland. It could include meadows, fields, heathland, moors, farmland, and even villages. Since the time of William the Conqueror, large areas of the country had been proclaimed as royal forest, giving the king a monopoly over hunting rights and the resources in these areas. By the reign of King John, about a third of the country was royal forest, including the famous Sherwood Forest. As the population of England expanded in the 12th and 13th centuries, the old forest laws became more difficult for both tenants and landlords. Permission from the chief forester was required before you could clear or cultivate any land within the forest. The right to pasture animals in the forest was strictly controlled, and this right could be removed by the king at any time. Even the felling of trees was closely regulated. If a violation of forest law was committed and no perpetrator could be found, the chief forester had the ability to impose a fine on the entire community. There were also harsh penalties for anyone found hunting deer, including mutilation, or in some cases, death. So what did the charter actually do? Under the charter, the king was required to give up areas of royal forest, particularly those that had been made royal forests during the reigns of Richard and John, as had originally been promised by Magna Carta. The charter also removed the death penalty for anyone found guilty of capturing the king's deer and removed mutilation as a lesser punishment. However, the deer in the royal forest were still the king's property and you were liable to pay a fine or end up in prison if you were caught hunting them. In contrast to Magna Carta, which primarily dealt with the rights of the barons, the Charter of the Forest can be seen as addressing the grievances of free men. It protected their rights to collect firewood, graze livestock and cut turf for fuel. But of course the term free men still did not apply to everybody. Today there are only two surviving copies of the 1217 Charter of the Forest. But what, other than the charters themselves, is the legacy of this medieval document? For centuries, ordinary people living within areas of royal forests were able to enjoy the freedoms set out in 1217. For example, in Sherwood Forest, as late as the mid-18th century, the poor residents of Edwinstow could supply themselves with firewood and gather ferns to sell for making soap. However, in the reign of Charles I, the boundaries of the royal forests were restored in England to their ancient limits as part of a scheme to maximise the king's income. The aim of this was to sell these forest lands for conversion to farmland, or in the case of the Forest of Dean, development for the iron industry. In 1641, a grand remonstrance listing the people's grievances was presented to Charles by Parliament. It included a petition to end the enlargement of the forests, which were contrary to the 1217 Charter. This was one of the key events in the lead-up to the English Civil War. The Charter of the Forest even featured in the Putney Debates. The fight to access and utilise common land continued in the following centuries, especially when forests were at risk of being enclosed or sold for redevelopment. For example, the enclosure of parts of Epping Forest gave rise to protest in the 1860s and 1870s, led by local villagers, supported by the recently formed Commons Preservation Society and the City of London. The resulting Epping Forest Act of 1878 transferred ownership of the forest to the City of London, guaranteeing local people's rights to freely graze their cattle and gather firewood. Since then, most of the Charter's principles have been written into other legislation, such as the Commons Act of 1876, which ruled that enclosure should only be allowed if there were public benefit. This was followed in 1919 by the Forestry Act, which set up the Forestry Commission to promote forestry and protect and manage forests. Remarkably, some clauses of the Charter remained in force as late as the 1970s, until finally being replaced by the Wild Creatures and Forest Laws Act of 1971. Magna Carta may have helped create the principle of freedom under the law, but the freedom of ordinary people to forage, graze their animals, and otherwise support their families by the fruits of the forest was just as vital.